Hey, take your Bibles with me this morning and turn back to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. This will be the fifth message in this series, Christ and His Sheep, Part 5. I've really been thinking about renaming these things. I, I would think, you know, I, I, they don't give you enough space on sermon audio to put everything. I'd like to have it in a series where people know that it's a verse-by-verse -verse study, but I'd really like to kind of name it. I would say this one, I, if, if you wanted to name this, ver this chapter, or, or this particular verse that we're going to look at this morning, I would say it's the abundant life through Christ would be a good name for it. Because that's what our Lord talks about in his 10th verse that we're going to look at this morning. That's all we're going to talk about, just one verse. I just couldn't get any further. But before we move on into this verse that we want to look at this morning, I, I want you to look back for just a moment. Look back at verse 9. Notice what, again what Christ said. He says, I am the door. Not one of many, he is the door. By me, through me, by his spirit, by regeneration and conversion, through his accomplished work at Calvary, if any man enter in, because there's no other way to enter other than through the Lord Jesus Christ, notice what he says, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and shall find pasture. Now like I told you in the message last Sunday, we see in this verse, in this verse, John chapter 10 verse 9, Christ set forth as the true shepherd of the sheep, the one sent of the Father to save all his sheep from their sins through his work as their substitute and surety. And in the words of verse 9, we see, and I, I think this is astonishing, in this, this, this word where he says, I am the door, we see the prompt beginning of the fulfillment of what God's servant Moses had prophesied about many, many years before. Listen to this. Talking about the promise of deliverer. In Numbers chapter 27, don't turn there, verse 15 through 17, Moses, prophet of God, says, And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in. Doesn't that sound a lot similar to the language in John chapter 10? I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in, and she, he shall go out, and he shall find pasture. He says that he may go in before them, which may lead them, which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Here it is. There's the beginning of the fulfillment of it. Now listen to me. I'm not naive enough to think that this wasn't a direct reference to who? Huh. Remember, Moses ain't going into the promised land. Remember, God told him to speak to the rock. What did he do? He smoked the rock a second time. And for that cause... His disobedience to his God, our God. God said, you will not go in. And Moses' concern was that there would be a man to lead him. I've led him. Didn't want to lead him, did he? But he led him as God instructed him, lead, led him. And he's praying, Lord, give him a leader. Who was that leader? Joshua, the son of Nun. And I know that. But folks, I'm also not naive enough to think that in this picture, this type, Scene of this man, because Joshua, you know what the word Joshua is actually, if you, if you translate it over into the, it's, it's, it's a Hebrew equivalent of what? Jesus. Joshua. I'm not naive enough to think and ignore the reality that Christ himself is the true shepherd of spiritual Israel, which was typified by this man Joshua, son of Nun. Go back and read Joshua's life. Because yeah, see, that's the thing. All these things that happened to physical Israel are types and pictures of what's going on with the true church, spiritual Israel, in every generation, led out by our great shepherd so that we're not a sheep without a shepherd. 
in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't our Lord Jesus Christ fulfill everything that Moses had prophesied? Listen to you. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. I find this astonishing. He expanded, expanded, taught them, made clear to them all the scriptures and all the scriptures, the things concerning who? Himself. You'd be surprised how many people think the Old Testament is a closed book to us. I hope it's not a closed book to you. I hope when you read those stories, when you read about Samson, or you read about David, or you read about Joseph, or you read about Joshua, or Elisha, or any of these Old Testament prophets, and stories, I hope you see how they point forward to the one, because that's what they were always all talking about, Bart. Every one of these Old Testament prophets, I told them in the Sunday Bible class, we, we seem to forget the Holy Spirit, just like God the Father and God the Son. You know, He does not change. I am the Lord God, I change not. Right? Of our Lord, it said in Hebrews, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. And in the same sense, God the Holy Spirit be co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Son. What do we know about the Spirit? He does not change either. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his role as the Spirit of God has always been to point where? To Messiah. And after Christ came, what? To point back to the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who had been prophesied by these Old Testament saints. So all of this is important for you and I to understand. Christ is indeed the fulfillment of every Old Testament type and pictures in their entirety. Now, look at verse 10, where we want to pick up this morning. The thief, now notice this, the thief cometh not but for to do three things. To steal, to kill, and to do what? To destroy. What, what an infinite difference there is between the way Christ, the true shepherd of the sheep, interacts and deals with the objects of his love, his sheep, those given to him in the everlasting covenant of grace, and the way the thief deals with his own, as well as the way the thief deals with who? God's children. Because he can't have us, right? He cannot ultimately destroy us, but does, does not he walk on this earth as a roaring lion seeking to devour them that are not? Can't, we can't be taken away. Now keep that in mind. That's so important. You think about this. Christ was commissioned and ordained by God the Father to this office as the shepherd of the sheep to enter into Judaism to retrieve or call out of Judaism, which was in reality a false religion, to call out national Israel, those that were his elect among national Israel, to call them out and bring them to himself. He was the door of exit for those that were in Judaism to gather his sheep from national Israel and bring them out of all the religious bondage, everything that kept them away from him, and draw them to himself. But more than that, Christ is the door, he's the entrance into the kingdom of God for all his sheep, both Jew and Gentile. And he saves us, and he keeps us, and he brings us out of ourselves, and he brings us into pastures of his grace and his mercy. According to the last part of this verse, verse 10, Christ says this, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But now, that's what he's going to do. But the thief, and notice what he said, the thief cometh not for to, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. One thing I noticed, and I, I'm grateful for all the different commentaries that I've got as I've looked over these things over the last couple of months studying. For One of the things I noticed in studying this passage this week was the way the Lord Jesus Christ changed the way he had previously stated this. 
in verse 8. Now listen to what he said in verse 8. He says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Plural, right? But now in this verse, our Lord Jesus Christ, he changes from the plural to what? The singular. How does he state it? The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and destroy. And I believe, and I say this is, this is what I think, I believe this change in, from singular to plural to singular shows the oneness of these thieves and these robbers of whom our Lord has talked about in other places with who? With their father. Who's their father? Well, listen to this. Christ told these same Pharisees, you are of your father. John chapter 8. Now we're in chapter 10. Same Pharisees. John chapter 8 verse 44. Our Lord says, you are of your father the devil. In the lust of your father you'll do. He was a murderer. Didn't he say kill? He was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaks of his own. In other words, those who identify with him, he's a liar and the father of it. So I think by changing from the plural to the singular, he's identifying the fact that every one of these false thieves and prophets, all that ever came, other than those that were truly his prophets, sent and ordained to God, all of them are in league with Satan, one with him, and they're all seeking to usurp this role, particularly these scribes and Pharisees, they had taken unto themselves. And the role that they had taken is the shepherd of the sheep. That's what they portrayed themselves by. It wasn't for the sheep's good. And it certainly wasn't for the glory of God. These three words Christ used to describe these thieves' activities, folks, they're eye-opening words. I'll tell you, I, I just love looking at words. And you just learn so much. The first word he says, now the thief comes not but for to do what? First of all, to steal. Now this word steal in the original is the word, and I can actually pronounce this Greek word because it's easy, klepto. Which, what, 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 what word, I mean, I'm not an English major, but what word have you always heard about that it starts with the prefix of klepto, a kleptomaniac? And it literally means, now think about this word that he's used here. He comes not but for to steal, klepto. It literally means to take away by theft or to take away by stealth. In other words, he's going to do it in a sneaky way. He's not going to come up blatantly. He's going to approach you in a way to try to steal from you in a way of stealth or theft. Now here's, here's one that amazed me. The word translated kill... It means to sacrifice, or listen to this one, to slay the sacrifice, particularly, now this is from Greek, this is from a Greek dictionary, New Testament dictionary, to slay the paschal, or Passover lamb. The thief, they come to use stealth. They come how? To promote Sacrifice. But the third word is this, to destroy. Now, I just don't see how we get that. I, I think I would have took a different way of translating this thing. You know what the word to destroy means? It means to put out of the way completely. To put out of the way completely. So this thief and those thieves who are one with him, they seek to take away by theft or by stealth. What do they seek to take away from sinners? What has been freely given to God's sheep. They, they, don't, doesn't Satan and his ministers and all those who are in league with him seek to destroy and take away from us the comfort and assurance of what we have been so freely given through the Lord Jesus Christ? Tell your friends and family, salvation, full free. I'm completely justified. I'm completely sanctified. I'm guaranteed eternal life. And what do they say? Oh, no, you can't be that way. Why? You're not holy enough. You're not moral enough. You're not sincerely enough. They seek to encourage people to do what? To kill. Meaning, they encourage, these scribes, and Pharisees in particular, what they encourage people to participate in? All the ceremonies. You know, there, there were several ceremonies. Every man child 
must be there. Right? So in encouraging men and women to sacrifice or participate in the slaying of the paschal lamb, they emphasize the importance they place on those animal sacrifices, which I just read a moment ago in Hebrews chapter 10. They were never, you hear me? They were never intended or purposed to put away one sin. You know that that I read in Hebrews chapter 10? Every time that word is translated sacrifice for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices. Same word that's translated kill. Same exact word. Those sacrifices, what? Passover lamb. The heave offering. The wave offering. The, the atonement offering. They could never take away sin. Sacrifices, and when our Lord said it, sacrifices and offerings, thou hast had no pleasure. In other words, it doesn't give him satisfaction. Christ used the same word in speaking to the Pharisees on another occasion. He told them, and listen to this now, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I, God, Jehovah, I will have mercy you know what the next word is? Not sacrifice. For I am not come to call righteous. Who's he come to call? Sinners. Sinners to repent. And these things come only to destroy, meaning to put out of the way entirely. Here's a good question. What did the Pharisees seek to put out of the way entirely for sinners? What did they cover? What did they cloud? Folks, think about it. They sought to encourage them to seek and hope for salvation in a way that God himself has forever excluded, that way that seemed right unto man, but the end of that way ends in death. Christ, folks, what is he? He's the way. He's the truth. And he's the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And they're seeking to put men out of the way, right? Now you think about this. Christ is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life to you and me. But he's a way that these thieves did not and could not know or understand. Because Paul said of all men and women by nature, including you and me as God's elect before regeneration and conversion, didn't he say this? As it's written, none righteous. No, not one. There's none that understand it. There's none that seeks after God. They're all going out of the... What are we going out of? We're going out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not loved, have they not known. There's no fear of God before that. That's us. <clears throat> and that's them. This thief and his disciples, folk, they're very subtle. And they're stealing and then they're killing and then they're destroying. It's hard to think. Stealing and they're killing and then they're destroying. Using a lot of the same language. It sounds so close that if it were possible... It would deceive the very elect of God. But thank God, you know what? It's not possible because he's already told us when the thieves and the robbers come and they spread their error and spread their lies, what do we know of a certain? The sheep will not hear their voice. But notice the contrast. Now that's them. But you notice the contrast between these false shepherds, these thieves and robbers, and the good shepherd. He says, I am come, on the other hand, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Christ is, is God's appointed surety and substitute and representative and redeemer of his people. Folks. He didn't come into this world in order to put sinners in a savable condition. 
And he didn't come into this world to place sinners in a situation where somehow or another they could gain or maintain or attain salvation if they fulfill whatever conditions placed on them by men or their various religions. Christ declared his coming is for one specific purpose, that they might have life. Who came? Was it? He already said, I'm the door. And he says, I. Who's, who's I here? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the promised seed of the woman. It's Emmanuel. He said, Emmanuel, I am come. This word come in the original means to come into being. I think that's interesting. To come into being. To arise or to come forth or to become known. The eternal life or salvation of all God's elect folks, it didn't rest on us. But it rested exclusively on the promised Messiah, the one sin of the Father, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, listen to this now, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus, and here's the same exact word, I am come, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Our salvation, this is so important, our salvation required the work of one who was divinely equipped. One who was both willing and capable of doing everything required to glorify God in his redemptive characters, both the just God and the Savior. Nothing short of the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ could save sinners. See, this required God the Father to send his holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinner's son into this world as the seed of the woman to do in our name and in our nature everything God's law and justice demanded of us. Remember this verse? When the fullness of time was come. Same word. To come into existence. God sent forth his son. Made of a woman. Made under the law. To do what? Think about this language here. To redeem them that were under the law. And that word redeem there actually means to buy back off the marketplace. To pay the price required. So if we're talking about all men and women without exception. Whom he prayed the price required for. Who's been redeemed? Everybody. But we know better than that. That they, that we might receive the adoption of son. Why did he come? We know who came, the Lord Jesus. Why did he come? That they might have life. Now, verses like this, statements made by our Lord like this, get religious people in a lot of trouble. Now, they do. Because they think and they teach that Christ come and offered a mere possibility. They think a statement like this, he's, he's come that they might have life. In other words, if, if you do what's required, you can get life. It's not what this verse is talking about. Words are so important. The phrase translated, they might have, in the original is the word from which we get our English word, echo. And it means this, to have or to hold in the hand in the sense of wearing. Or to have or hold possession of the mind. So Christ has come into this world in time to live, to obey God's law, not for himself but for us. To suffer and bleed and die under the guilt, penalty and condemnation of God's sin, God's perfect law and justice. And be raised again so that all the sheep, all those given to him by God the Father in the everlasting covenant of grace, will actually have or possess what? Life. I am come that they can have and hold in their hand and I can by my spirit take possession of their minds and give them life. I like what John Gill wrote on this particular part of this passage. He said, Christ came that the sheep might have life. Or the elect of God might have life, both spiritual and eternal life. Who is the rest of mankind, are by nature dead in trespasses and sin, 
and liable in themselves to an eternal death. Christ came into this world in a human nature to give his flesh, his body, his whole human nature, both body and, but listen to this, thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Isaiah said that. Offered himself both body and soul. Why did he offer himself both body and soul? For the life of these persons that they might actually live here and live eternally hereafter. Doesn't that make sense? The Apostle John stated it this way. And we know that the Son of God, here's the same word of God again, is come. He came into existence. Right? That, you think about this. If that immaculate conception of our Lord Jesus Christ, when God the Holy Spirit overshadowed the, the Virgin Mary, and he created in Christ, in, in her what? In her womb, that holy thing. The Lord Jesus Christ. He became both God and man. Right? He always was God, but in that union. I can't explain that. But I just know it to be so. He said, we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Christ Jesus. This is the true God. And folks, this is life. That, that word is eternal life. The same word that our Lord used over in our text. I'm come that they might have life. This life can only come through the righteousness of God. And this righteousness of God was established by the doing and dying of the Lord Jesus Christ is our Messiah. Paul put it like this, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, who? The Lord Jesus Christ, shall many be, not put in a position where they can attain righteousness, or start being righteous, or get progressively righteous, they're made righteous. Notice the last part of this verse, and we'll close. And that they might have it more abundantly. You know, our Lord just, <laughs> he knew how, how prone we are to be so discouraged and distraught. Does he not? And the word here translated that they might have, the same word translated they might have in the first part of this verse. And it means the same thing, to have or to hold in the hand or to have possession of the mind. And the word translated, if you notice, is is in italic, so it wasn't in the original. That word translated more abundantly in the original means, and I love this, exceeding some number or measure or rank or need. Exceeds it. This life which our Lord Jesus Christ actually bestows and gives to each and every one of the objects of his his, his love, those that he freely gives to you and me, this life that is received and rested in by God-given faith, folks, it exceeds everything and anything we could ever possibly imagine. Paul said, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God had ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. Those thieves didn't know it. Folks, even Satan didn't know it. The thief doesn't know it. For had they known it, what would they have not done? <laughs> they wouldn't have killed the Lord of glory. But as it's written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man by nature, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We didn't know it by nature, right? Right? I don't know how long ago it was before you believed. You didn't know. It couldn't even imagine what you've been freely given. But, listen, he goes on. But God hath revealed them those things that we can't comprehend by nature. Nor can we take into our thought process. He's revealed them to us. How did he reveal them? By his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, even the deep things. And I'll say this in closing this morning. The knowledge and understanding of this abundant life is what enables you and me to endure anything and everything this life brings our way. Paul used the same word in this verse. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulation. And I'll tell you what, none suffered like Saul, Paul of Tarsus did. 
And they just didn't. You go back and read his history in the book of Acts. See how he was hated by both friend and foe. In prison, persecuted, ultimately killed over the gospel. A gospel that he himself had persecuted and sought to put to death. And people looked at what was going on in his life and he says, don't think because you see what's going on in me. Because he said, my suffering is what? It's your glory. For this cause, I bow. Think about it. For this cause, what? The fact that God has counted me worthy to suffer for his name's sake. I think that's one of the things that amazed me in the book of Acts. Thrown in prison, they're buying, you know, remember the Philippian jailer? They had tightened them down the screws as tight as they could, putting as much pain. And at midnight, Paul and Silas are in there, and they're praying, and what are they doing? They are thanking God that they have been counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. Told them again, and I tell you, same spirits in us. Not another. He said, I bow my knees to the God of our, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole world in heaven and earth is named. And he grants you according to the riches of his grace to be strengthened with might by his spirit. Where? In the inner man. In our heart. In our understanding. In our soul. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love, not our love, but his love, might be able. Now listen, because it's no, think about what he's done. Think about it, what it costs to redeem your soul. Do you not think if he's redeemed our wretched soul, every single solitary thing he thing, sends our way is not for our good and his glory? Do you think he would drop us into Greece after delivering us from eternal condemnation? You might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of God which passeth knowledge. <laughs> I can't get my hands around God's love. I can see why he would hate me. Seek to destroy me. That you might be filled with the fullness of God. Here it is. Now unto him that is able to do. And here's the same word. That they might have life and that they might have it abundant. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly. Above all we could ever ask or think. According to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church of Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. We'll come back next week and we'll pick up verse 11. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. I appreciate your presence. Lord bless you.